Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. My name is Tara Calliman and I'm in charge of social media marketing here at Victor Ops. I'd like to welcome you to our Blameless Postmortems webinar. I'm going to be helping out with any questions you might have during the webinar, so if you have something you'd like to ask, simply type it into the box in the bottom left corner. When we have a moment during or after the presentation, we'll be sure to leave time for Jace to answer all questions. Now, I'm proud to introduce Jason Hand, our resident DevOps evangelist, who will be sharing his expertise on the topic of blameless postmortems. Jason? Thank you, Tara. And thank you, everyone, for joining us this morning. Uh, as Tara mentioned, I'm Jason Hand, uh, DevOps evangelist here at Victor Ops. And there's a couple of different ways you can reach out to me. Um, of course, we'll do some questions and answering uh, throughout, the por- or throughout this presentation. Uh, but feel free to shoot me an email later uh, or reach out to me on Twitter if you'd like. Um, just uh, Jason at VictorOps.com or at Jason Hand on Twitter. <clears throat> so, just a little bit of background on, on myself so you kind of know who I am and where I'm coming from. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm the, of the uh, DevOps evangelist here at, at VictorOps. Uh, but prior to that, I was the director of platform support for AppDirect, which is an online marketplace for cloud applications. Uh, from be- before that, I was the director of technical support for a, a startup here in Boulder, Colorado, known as Standing Cloud. And uh, before that, I was director of operational systems for a company uh, known as AFI Supply. And of course, I've got a list of other little um, hobbies and interests that pretty much everyone here in Colorado um, has at some point. So, postmortems. Um, first of all, I'd like to point out that there are public and internal postmortems, uh, and a postmortem exists in many different formats across all industries. Uh, they can be commonly referred to as project retrospective, learning review, post-project review. There's actually all kinds of names for them. And I've listed many of them out here. Uh, I think my favorite one is actually the touchdown meeting, although I've never heard of anyone uh, actually calling, uh, calling their postmortem a touchdown meeting. So given now that you know sort of some other names of what could be commonly referred to as a postmortem, I'd like to take a little bit of a, a poll, just a show of hands, of everyone that's uh, listening today, do you feel like you're currently uh, performing postmortems within your team or within your organization? So we'll take a moment to go ahead and uh, give everybody an opportunity to just answer that question really quick. And also, there'll be a few questions throughout this, um, throughout this webinar. And uh, this is actually a great opportunity or a great time for you guys to submit any questions if you have anything you'd like, to, uh, like for us to answer. Um, but otherwise, we'll, t- we'll take care of questions at the end. All right, great. So here are the results. Um, it looks like almost 70% of our audience p- feels like they're currently performing postmortems, which is actually great. Um, So the other 30%, I'm assuming you're either just now uh, starting to understand or hear about postmortems, or maybe you just, you know, you've you've been doing something that sort of resembles a postmortem, but you're here to understand what actually can make it a blameless postmortem and how you can how you can do better with that. So hopefully we'll be able to touch on several um, different areas regarding uh, all of that. So I feel like, especially after looking at that poll, everyone has a pretty good idea of what a postmortem is, but let's quickly review. Uh, first of all, it's totally common for organizations to hold a postmortem after a successful event. Uh, what we're going to be talking about today are postmortems related to an adage so that we can focus on the idea of blameless. When do you want to do a postmortem? Well, um, it's important to have everyone involved. You want to be fully recovered, you want to take a step back and get some rest, but you don't want to wait so long that that important details begin to fade. So I've got a question for you. Um, Who do you feel like should be involved in your your blameless postmortem? Do you feel like it should just be your management, just sort of your upper tier part of your team? Do you feel like it should be just the dev and the ops and maybe also the QA and, and information security teams? Um, do you think it should be only those who played a role in the outage? 
uh, or maybe the resolution, or maybe all of this. So we'll, again, we'll take a second here to let everybody sort of answer those questions. While you're answering these questions, if you are following along on Twitter or you want to live tweet any of these, we're using the hashtag VOWebinar for today's event. Hashtag VOWebinar. Just doing my job. <laughs> All right, great. So here are the results from, the, um, <clears throat> from that poll. And it looks like most of you feel like all of the above um, is the correct response. And actually, you're correct. Um, so <clears throat> ideally, the entire team takes part in your post-mortem. So all of the above, kind of a trick question. Um, oops, too far. Um, all of the above, ideally, you want the entire team to take part in the post-mortem. If that's not possible, then you should have uh, all team members that played a part in the outage and resolution, as well as any senior people or other vital teams that need to know all of the details of exactly what happened. And if that's not specific enough, you want pretty much everyone or anyone who introduced the problem, anyone who identified the problem, anyone who responded to the problem, anyone who debugged the problem, anyone else that's interested, so pretty much everyone. Uh, and just keep in mind that we're participating in these um, essentially to learn. Why do we do these? Well, we want to know what happened in as much detail as possible so that we can learn and improve our systems and our processes. Once you begin leaning towards complete transparency, you're on your way towards a truly blameless postmortem. Now, there's a lot of uh, templates, I guess, and suggestions out on the web on how to perform a postmortem. I've got um, just some sort of general guidelines here that we'll go through real quick. Um, First of all, you want to talk about the incident timeline. So what happened through the entire beginning and end of your incident? Uh, additionally, you want to talk about the escalation steps. So who was involved and, and maybe who did you pull into this firefight uh, to help resolve the problem? Um, what was done to, to actually resolve the problem? You want to document all of that. Um, Next, you want to create a remediation plan. This is actually very, very important. You don't want to just talk about the problem. <clears throat> you actually want to come up with a plan to uh, put something in place to actually resolve this and, and remedy the situation. And then last, you want to make it available. So whatever you end up doing, whatever tools you use for your blameless postmortem, um, it's essential to make it available to everyone on the team so they can go back and review it because, again, we're trying to learn. And if you can make it um, available for anyone to come back and review, it's going to just be good material for you know, onboarding or just essentially looking back uh, in time and seeing what you did to take care of incidents. Um, so. During my research into this whole topic of blameless postmortems, I, found, I came across um, kind of a booklet uh, from O'Reilly Media written by a gentleman by the name of Dave Zweibeck from Next Big Sound. And in it, he highlights what he calls the three R's. Um, and the three R's are essentially regret, reason, and remedy. So regret would be an acknowledgement of the impact uh, of the outage and an apology. Usually this is going to be referring mostly to just customer-facing postmortems, but it can definitely be you know, a part of an internal one as well. Reason is a linear outage timeline from initial incident detection to resolution, including the so-called root causes. And I want to point out there the so-called part. Uh, we'll come back to that uh, a little bit. Remedy. Remedy is a list of remediation, remediation items to ensure that this particular outage won't repeat. Um, so let's talk about remedy for a minute because I think that uh, actually regret and reason are fairly straightforward. So moving to reaction or moving from reaction to action, remedy. Um, are you using the SMART method? You know, specific, measurable, agreed upon, realistic, and time bound. These are all, uh, fair, this is a fairly common method used in a lot of different things, but it's, it's very, very good to apply this when you're talking about re remediation excuse me, remediation tactics. Um, are you entering in a JIRA ticket or some sort of ticket into your bug tracking software? How are you following up with real action? So those are the basics of just sort of a general postmortem and uh, kind of in general. Now let's actually kind of switch gears and talk about blameless and why it's important to keep in mind uh, a lot of different factors so that you can make it a truly blameless postmortem. 
So I'm going to start by telling just a, a brief little story uh, that hopefully will highlight or give you just a, uh, kind of an example of what a good blameless postmortem would be. In 2011, I was brought on to a tech startup uh, here in Boulder known as Standing Cloud. And uh, I was brought on essentially to build a support team as well as uh, manage some, some of our higher, uh, high-end customers. And during my time, <clears throat> there was a situation where a customer approached us and asked us to assist with a mi migration from one cloud server to another. Uh, basically, they just needed to upgrade to a, a larger instance. And uh, I took it upon myself to reach out to the customer, and instead of just assisting, I decided that I would actually do it for them. And I wanted to do it during my office hours. That way I could ensure if there were any problems. Uh, I was actually in the office, and I had some additional resources to hopefully resolve any you know, hiccups that might come up. Um, so they were glad to let me go ahead and take that on. I stepped through the entire process. It was very straightforward. It's something I'd done hundreds of times before without any kind of a problem. So, I went ahead and I migrated their uh, software to a larger server and then just sort of went through my, my usual checklist to make sure everything was uh, good and then sent them an email just as a follow-up to let them know, um, you know everything had been taken care of. I'd gone in and, and checked that I was able to log in and by all accounts everything looked great. Uh, at this point in the day it was late enough uh, for me to go ahead and head home and I, but I asked them to just go ahead and send me an email to let me know that they received my message and that everything looked good. So. Later on in the evening, I did finally get a response back from them saying that they were able to log in. However, when they started to dig into their data, they realized that they were actually missing months and months worth of data. Obviously, this is very troubling. Um, they you know, let me know that this is important, that they really you know, need to have this stuff back. So uh, even though it was late at night, I dove in and started diagnosing what was going on and what may have happened and where the data might be. Well, after several um, probably hours or so of digging through data and pulling in different team members to help kind of diagnose and troubleshoot, uh, we eventually determined that the data itself was never backed up and therefore never restored um, at any point during the time that they were hosting on Sandy Cloud. And even though there was never any signs and there were no log entries or any indication that there was a problem with any of the backups, the system just wasn't backing up their data. So when we moved them to a new server, and we um, essentially unpacked their archive of data, <clears throat> a lot of information was missing. So as you can imagine, that wasn't a very pleasant email for me to send off to the customer to let them know that we've spent the last several hours looking through everything and doing everything we can, um, but their data is just not there. Um, so the next morning I came into the office feeling uh, very down, very upset with myself and uh, wondering what I could have done differently to keep this from happening. Uh, to be honest, I was actually afraid for my job. I was afraid of being reprimanded um, from my boss all the way up to the CEO, and I just was not looking forward to it all. Um, but to my surprise, pleasant surprise, uh, we actually um, had a pleasant stand-up, a, a good talk about what had happened. And um, honestly, there was never any kind of finger pointing. There was never a finger pointing at me or any other team members. Um, you, know, you can make the argument that this type of a problem should have been found during um, quality testing or maybe even during development, but there was never any of, uh, anything that indicated any kind of finger pointing. It was all essentially just what happened and how did this happen and what can we do to make uh, our system better to avoid this in the future. And that was kind of my first introduction into what I now know as a blameless postmortem. At the time, I had no idea that that's essentially what I was um, taking part in. I'm going to give you a moment just to read through this quote. Um, earlier this summer, I attended a Velocity Santa Clara event, and uh, while I was there, I got to catch this presentation by a gentleman named J. Paul Reed, who uh, his, his presentation was labeled uh, A Look at Looking into the Mirror. And a lot of what I've learned um, as I've been researching blameless postmortems, I've actually learned from J. Paul Reed and a number of other guys, including Dave Zweibeck that I'll mention uh, here. But I really like this quote. Um, I felt like when I think back to my incident with Standing Cloud, when I went into that office uh, that day, I felt like I was the bad apple. This was my fault. I'm the one who was pushing all the buttons. I'm the one who um, was doing all of the steps, and therefore, you know, it was definitely my fault. But if not, if, even if you didn't want to say it was my fault, um, I felt like this bad apple. So what is a blameless postmortem? 
What blameless postmortem means that team members should be accountable but not responsible. And I know that accountability and responsibility are a gray area, but uh, just, before, uh, just before we started our presentation, I tried to find a really good um, example or definition of a way to describe the difference between the two. And this is, this is a fairly good one that I found. Responsibility may be bestowed, but accountability must be taken. In other words, responsibility can be given or received, even assumed, but that doesn't automatically guarantee that personal accountability will be taken, which means that it's possible to bear responsibility for something or someone, but still lack accountability. Transparency. You want to be open and honest about what took place. What was the larger set of circumstances that caused the incident or outage? The purpose of your postmortem is not to put blame on anyone on the team. The purpose is to figure out what happened and how to improve it. You want to focus more on how rather than why. The idea of blameless postmortems stems from the understanding that real conditions of failure in the complex systems that all of us are likely building or striving to build are very real and play a huge role in how we approach an emergency situation. And last, counterfactuals are not allowed. Talking about something that did not happen is essentially what a counter counterfactual is, and it's not useful and it's not allowed in a blameless postmortem. Uh, and, and an example of a counterfactual would be something like uh, stating, um, you should have seen this problem. So words like should and would, uh, shoulda, woulda, coulda type of, type of situation. So we avoid counterfactuals. Um, I mentioned earlier that book, The Human Side of Postmortems. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes that Dave has from that book. The organization must continually affirm that individuals are never the root cause of outages. Um, <clears throat> searching for a root cause um, is a dead end, honestly. There isn't, a sing there isn't going to be a single root cause. You're not going to find a root cause of failure any easier than you'll find a root cause of success. And that's an idea that I actually picked up from John Allspaul from Etsy, who is another person um, who, if you're not familiar with him, definitely look him up because he's doing a lot of work in this area of blameless postmortems too. And when I read uh, something where he had stated how there's not going to be a root cause of um, failure any more than there's a root cause of success, something actually cl clicked inside of me. If you think back to my unfortunate example, I was lucky to be a part of a team that got that idea. They never blamed me. They never pointed fingers at someone who didn't you know, test something or whatever the case may be. They simply looked for ways to improve, improve the system, improve the product, and therefore improve the business. Instead of asking why, we actually want to ask how. Why insinuates that you're looking for a root cause, whereas how can bring us to the conditions that allowed the event to take place to begin with. And I've got this great quote from a guy named Sidney Decker who, we'll talk, or who we mentioned a few slides back, the one about the bad apples. And the quote is, cause is not something found in rubble. Cause is created in the minds of the investigators. A few months ago, I was in Minneapolis for an event known as DevOps Days. There's a, a lot of them all over the country, and they're great. And during that event, I hosted an open space discussion on the topic of blameless postmortems, knowing that I'd be building this pre presentation, and we had this webinar and all that. So <clears throat> as I was beginning to build this talk around that, it seemed you know, timely to go ahead and suggest doing an open space on this subject. Well, in the audience, to my great surprise, was J. Paul Reed, who I mentioned earlier from the Velocity Talk, and another gentleman by the name of Ian Malpass from Etsy. And Ian presented at the talk, or at DevOps Days as well, and he did this great talk on, um, that's titled, Fallible Humans. And this tweet here was actually someone paraphrasing one of Ian's um, comments, which I, I believe the full um, idea, or the full kind of context of what Ian said is this. If failure happens, all we're te teaching people to do is sweep failure under the carpet, to hide mistakes and direct blame elsewhere. What we're not doing is learning. Another part of Ian's uh, presentation, he touched on this idea of efficiencies ver versus thoroughness. So ETTO, the efficiency thoroughness trade-off. And if you think about it, this is something that we do almost every day as we learn and interact. It's not always conscious, 
Uh, it's not you know, a conscious decision, but it's something we're doing constantly. It's just the way we react towards events and situations as they come up. We find more efficient ways of doing things. As a result, we sacrifice being thorough. So in our efforts towards efficiency, we often drift away from being thorough. And the key principle of this ETTO is that this quote-unquote trade-off is totally normal. Adjustments back and forth between efficiency and thoroughness may lead to unexpected and negative outcomes, but the exact same processes can produce success as well. Here's another quote um, from Ian from that same talk. Um, Every day we make decisions on whether to be efficient or to be thorough. And there are different variables at play that help us choose between efficiency and thoroughness. And those variables make up the cause, which then leads us to effect. In J. Paul Reed's uh, presentation that I mentioned earlier, he painted this just wonderful picture of a set of uh, standing dominoes, followed by another image uh, on the next slide showing a slightly more, you know, slightly bigger picture of what's going on, which included one falling domino. And with each slide that he advanced, you could see more and more of the picture. So the next slide was actually displaying a hand that was near that falling domino, indicating that the hand may have had something to do with that domino that's about to fall into the other standing ones. And then the next slide advanced, and you'd see that there's actually a dog in the picture, indicating that maybe the dog had something to do with, with the dominoes. And the point being that if you step back and take a, look at this, you know, take a look at the bigger picture, you start to see that there may have been many different factors that played a part in the problem. So how do these variables provide cause and effect and stress or in cognitive bias? All right, so we're going to do a little test real quick. I'd like for you to read this sentence and tell me how many Fs you count in the sentence. So go. While people are doing this, Jason, we had a question come in. I was wondering if maybe you could address it quickly. Sure. Um, what is the role of management in some of these postmortems? Um, management essentially is going to be just a, an actor just like everyone else. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, you do want everyone to be involved. Um, the only person who may sort of be running a postmortem would be who you might call your incident commander or uh, maybe the person, the primary person who was on call during that incident. But in general, management is just there to learn just like everyone else. So there's really uh, no advanced interaction that they should kind of assume or take on, but you definitely want them to be a part of it. Okay, so back to our little test there. <clears throat> I asked, how many Fs do you count in that, uh, in that sentence? Co- uh, count, excuse me, capitalized and lowercase. <clears throat> so as we can see, um, the results are kind of what I expected them to be. We've got 20% saying three, 20% saying four, another 20 on five, and then the most of you said six. And those of you that said six are correct. So let's actually just go back real quick, if I can, and I want you to just take another look at this sentence and see where you may have missed an F if you were uh, one of those that said three, four, or five. And I think you'll notice pretty quickly that it's the Fs within the word of. Let's go back to where we were. So this is a great example of cognitive bias. Cognitive bias is a mental shortcut. Cognitive biases can deeply affect our behaviors towards situations and others, as well as our ability to process information by moving us towards mental shortcuts that are optimized for timeliness over accuracy at the expense of rationalizing irrational behavior. So this is a perfect example of ETTO, efficiency versus thoroughness. Your brain just skipped right over those Fs. Stress and cognitive biases that form the human side of postmortems are typically left out of the process. This is a direct quote from Dave Zweibeck in his, uh, his book, The Human Side of Postmortems, and I love it because it's so true, and this is all ex- you know, exactly what we're talking about right here. Cognitive bias is a mental shortcut, as we saw. It's a mistaken reasoning, evaluating, remembering, or some other cognitive process often, re- often occurring as a result of holding onto one's preferences and beliefs regardless of contrary information. 
Essentially, what you infer or presume about people and situations may be incorrect. We create our own social reality based on those biases. Cognitive bias is a large philosophical topic and one that I've, I've actually seen a number of presentations and, and read a lot of information, and it's all very, very fascinating to me, but unfortunately that would be a completely separate uh, presentation that maybe we'll have to do at another time. But let's take a closer look at stress. First of all, I want to uh, just get a quick poll on whether or not you feel like when it comes to performance, do you feel that stress is good or bad? So let's take a second and let everybody to answer that question. While we're letting folks uh, decide on their stress levels within the poll, Jason, we were wondering, uh, we had a question come in, how do you suggest dealing with sensitive team members in a post-mortem setting? <clears throat> sensitive team members. Um, I'm, I'm guessing this is sort of referring to someone within your team who may feel that um, they just don't deal with some of the stress or maybe they feel like there's going to be some blame and they're just not really sure. They don't really deal with that type of thing very well. Um, you know, I, I recently read something um, where people were coming up with creative names for their postmortems, and one was actually called our Puppies and Rainbows meeting. And I think the idea of what, why they called it the Puppies and Rainbows meeting is essentially just to, to reinforce that this isn't, this isn't about pointing fingers, no one's going to get in trouble, we're just here to learn. So by calling it Puppies and, and Rainbows meetings, um, you know, right up front, hopefully that sort of eases any, any tension and anybody who's maybe just worried about participating in those types of meetings. So. Uh, hopefully that answers the question. Okay, let's move forward with our results. Is stress good or bad? Almost a, almost a split, actually. So slightly uh, uh, higher results for good versus bad, uh, which, is, which is great, actually. I love it that there's sort of a split here. Um, when you think about, and actually, you know, this is sort of a trick question. So, uh, but when you think about <coughs> um, stress, uh, a, lot of, a lot of situations that you'll find yourself in, you'll actually find that stress can be a good thing. If I think back to when I was in you know, high school and college and participating in different competitive sports and you know, just sort of playing any kind of games, really, any time that I was playing against someone who was better than me, it sort of upped my game. And a lot of that, I think, has to do with stress. So uh, this actually, um, <clears throat> this diagram that we're looking at here, I, I actually find to be fascinating. And by the way, there was, you know, kind of no right answer on that poll. So, um, yes, stress can be good, but it's actually up to a certain point. And that's kind of what this diagram um, highlights. So, uh, the, the diagram is extremely interesting, uh, although I feel like I've known this for years. I've just never really stopped and, and thought about it. But stress can sometimes be good. In fact, Many, many would claim that um, you know, they actually work better under stress. I know for me, for example, as I was building this webinar, um, you know, I kind of waited to the last minute. I was working on things this morning. Actually, all of us here on the team were kind of throwing things together at the last minute. And, I'll, and I, ha I really feel confident that a lot of that has to do with stress. But here we are, and everything's working out great. Um, so stress can sometimes be good. Uh, you can see in the diagram that simple tasks are much more resilient to the effects of stress than complex ones. Uh, simple tasks would be something like uh, things that are well learned, practiced, and performed with little to no effort. Um, whereas, well, actually a good example I can uh, kind of mention there um, would be driving. You know, a lot of times uh, we'll be driving, going out on a road trip, or just going to see family and friends, and you may be driving for 30 minutes, an hour or longer, and you just sort of realize, huh, I don't really remember anything that took place in this you know, last 10, 15 minutes. You don't remember changing lanes. You don't remember using your turn signal. You don't remember looking in the mirror. Um, those are all things that are just basically um, learned and have become muscle memory. It's just sort of natural. Whereas a complex task is going to be something that's more unpredictable or has a feeling of a lack of control over the situation. So, like I said, that was kind of a trick question, and it was good that we had sort of a split. I know probably some of you are like, uh, you know, this doesn't seem right. It can't be, you know, there's got to be like an option C or something, and, and you're right. Actually, um, stress uh, can be both. So, knowing this, should we seek methods to reduce stress? 
you know, despite that, uh, that poll and that model that we just saw, and I think most of us would probably agree that no, we don't want to just reduce stress. What you actually want to do is manage it. Um, I'm sure some of you in the audience are probably familiar with Netflix, uh, well definitely Netflix, but at least maybe more specifically Netflix's Chaos Monkey, which is part of their simian army that they've built um, essentially to simulate outages within their environment. Um, so what they've done is just you know, built this tool that they can go and run kind of within a controlled environment to uh, take down certain parts of their infrastructure so that allows their team to actually react and kind of learn how to deal with these outages. It develops this muscle memory of how to deal with problems which can then reduce stress levels uh, when charged with, with dealing uh, with an actual outage. It's kind of like um, fire drills. If you remember fire drills and tornado drills when we were younger in school, they seem dumb, they seem you know, sort of like everybody knows what to do. Well, the point is you're just going to keep doing these until it just becomes second nature. Um, I'm a musician, I play the guitar a lot, and I like to compare this to actually playing the guitar and the muscle memory that you develop over that. Um, you eventually just get to where your hands and your fingers are just doing all the work. Um, you really don't even have to think about it. So if you can do that with your infrastructure and just really anything in general, um, it's, it's always going to be a good way to sort of reduce that stress. Uh, all this indicates that you shouldn't make an effort to eliminate stress, but rather manage it and use it as a tool. But you can't lose sight that it can and does play a role in outages. So you have to keep in mind that reducing the impact of stress through practice and developing this muscle memory, <clears throat> well, that is great, but it doesn't actually <clears throat> address the evaluative threat, which we'll talk about now. So what is evaluative threat? <clears throat> well, an example is finger pointing and blaming of outages to specific people or teams. Organizations where postmortems post are far from blameless and where being the root cause of an outage could result in demotion or maybe getting fired, well, that creates a large stress surface. And what kind of impact does that have on your team? And as a result, your product and, of course, your business. So how do we address these stress surfaces? Well, first of all, what is a stress surface? To a certain degree, it's the evaluative threat that we just mentioned, but it's also <clears throat> a whole, you know, it's also stress as a whole when you look at situations due to many factors. So things like, um, you know, variable situations, like is it a novel or is it an unusual event? Is this unpredictable? Was there anything that you can control in this situation? Is there an opportunity for negative judgment? Um, what's going on at home? What are your relations with uh, your relationships with your family, with your siblings, with your spouse? What's your health like? Are you getting enough sleep? All of these actually have something to do with your stress, um, with your stress surface. So how do we capture this? Now that we sort of are starting to realize that cognitive bias and stress and stress surface and evaluative threats all have at least some, something to do with dealing with these incidents, how do we capture all that? Some companies um, have actually began issuing questionnaires uh, immediately after an outage to measure stress levels during the incident. Team members are asked a series of questions independently from each other to avoid groupthink. Um, and this is all rooted in the understanding that real conditions of failure in complex systems exist. And finding ways to improve performance during outages can only be achieved by reducing their stress surface. So we want to create an environment where there is no fear of punishment. To some people, this idea of not punishing you know, may make sense, but others, uh, maybe they're not totally buying that just yet. So I have a lot of, you know, a lot of people approach me and say, why wouldn't you punish someone for doing you know, something wrong or doing something terribly bad? Well, first of all, it de-incentivizes everyone to give details necessary to get an understanding of what actually took place. So if, if you end up punishing somebody and for something they did, well, if that comes up again sometime later, of course, you know, anyone that's involved in, in that whole thing isn't going to feel any sort of incentive to speak up and talk about it because they know what, took, what happened last time. Someone, you know, was blamed or punished. A lack of understanding of how the accident occurred pretty much guarantees that it's going to repeat. So if it's not with the original person, certainly someone else in the future, because the facts weren't allowed to surface. It made sense to take action, or it made sense to take that action at that time. Well, why is that? You know, what is it that makes you think 
that running that command during that incident is actually going to fix the problem. So you want to understand that. We want to create a culture where team members make an effort to find balance between safety and accountability and get away from the idea that inv individuals, not situations, cause errors. We create a situation where people who do make mistakes become experts on it and can, re and can educate the rest of the team on how not to make them in the future. Think of it in terms of offering criminals immunity. We do it to get more information rather than just punish and stop the flow of information. Becoming more accepting of failure at an organization level isn't a new concept. It's not something that I've just come up with on my own. Um, and Michael Jordan, you know, here, he didn't come up with this idea either. This, this is also isn't something that's only, you know, really something that really intuitive companies like tech startups are doing. We see it in all kinds of industries and companies of many, many sizes. And why is that? Well, to be honest, it's because it works. You know, there's, uh, J. Paul Reed said it perfectly in his presentation in Velocity, there is real science behind all of this. And hopefully I've been able to highlight some of that to you. And, and my, my hope is that you'll take these ideas and, and kind of think about them a little bit more and, and go and <clears throat> actually, you know, address all of this in a broader sense and hopefully start to agree with a lot of it. Where do we start? So what if your company isn't doing postmortems at all? Like, how do we get started? Well, first of all, you want to begin by documenting everything. You document the log details, conversations that you have in chat, in um, email, escalations. Document everything. And have a place to keep notes so that you can you know, go in and not just document the, the actual specifics of what took place, but maybe what you were thinking at the time <clears throat> or just anything that's relevant. So some place where you can add some notes. If you can, uh, provide a method to uh, provide some sort of calculations. You know, what was the mean time to re resolution or the mean time to recovery? Because as you start to document these things, you can see improvements. What was the severity level? So, like, how big was this problem? Was it, you know, a major outage, a minor outage, somewhere in between? You want to document that. Save it somewhere uh, where it's easy access. You want to make sure that all these postmortems are kept in a location that it's accessible by everyone on your team. And then remediation tactics. You know, enter in JIRA tickets or you know, whatever you're using for your bug tracking software. <clears throat> make sure you, you make some sort of actionable plan so that you can move forward and actually improve. Um, I know that several of you that are participating in today's webinar are actually Victor Ops customers, so um, likely you're aware of the postmortem reporting tool that we have. Obviously, many of you are not, uh, are not using Victor Ops, so <clears throat> you know, that tool is not necessarily available to you, but there's, there's actually uh, several other options out there, and I encourage you to use something you know, just to get started. Uh, those of you um, who are familiar with Etsy, they have created this uh, open source tool that's available on GitHub. It's just called their morgue. I encourage you to, to look into that, uh, download that. It does take a little bit of manual setup and some effort to get it going, but it's a great tool at least to get started. Um, and if that's too much effort, too technical, um, at least try to do some sort of internal wiki. So just a, a live document that you can come back to and you can make notes on and, and sort of document everything that took place. Um, and here's just a, a quick example or a quick screenshot on what uh, our tool looks like, and also you can sort of see the Etsy's morgue tool, although it's hidden to a little bit. So with all that, I'm going to leave you with you know, just a couple final thoughts. Uh, the systems that we're designing are really, really freaking complex. There are a lot of variables and pieces to the bigger picture at play. Don't forget about the human variables that we talked about today because they do play a huge, huge role in all this. You can learn and improve or you can blame and punish, but you can't do both. So I'll say to you, don't blame others and don't blame yourself like I did. Keep it blameless and you'll find the truth. Thank you for attending today's webinar. Um, it's been great talking to you all, and I think if we've got some, we'll go ahead and move forward with our questions. We actually do have a few questions, Jason. Uh, the first one's pretty... Uh, Pretty basic, but I think it's something that warrants a really good answer from you. So who runs a postmortem? Who actually leads the process? Yeah, so great question. Um, typically, it's going to be the person who um, was the primary person on call. If you're using some sort of on-call setup, uh, whoever was 
Uh, in a lot of cases, they'll call it the incident commander. So just who was that main person who was responsible for the system or the outage or whatever was going on at that point um, during, that, you know, during that problem. Um, with that said, um, it doesn't have to be that person necessarily. You could have someone who's maybe just a little bit more uh, proficient with these and just sort of be um, kind of, um, you know, I can't think of a great name, but just someone who understands the postmortem process and kind of can help you walk through that. But um, yeah, I would say there's no specific person that has to run it. And it's actually, you know, you have to keep in mind this is for everyone to be involved. So even though there might be one person that kind of keeps it moving along, uh, there doesn't have to be one person that sort of uh, owns it and manages it throughout the process. Excellent. Um, additionally, what scenarios warrant a postmortem? Great. So um, as I mentioned very early on, um, postmortems don't have to be just about negative problems. You know, incidents and outages are, are easy to talk about, but um, postmortems are also things that you can do um, after a successful event. So. I can tell you here at Victor Ops, whenever we do a successful deployment, um, we have somewhat of a postmortem to just talk about what went well and you know how did that, how was that better than other situations, and how can we learn from this? And then maybe there's even though it went well, we can still improve from something. Um, so it doesn't have to always be uh, negative, you know, kind of situations. Um, with that said, obviously. You know, there's going to be different severity levels with your incidents, and it's kind of up to you in terms of, you know, how do you feel like <clears throat> certain incidents are, let's just say, for example, if there's a, a really high severe um, problem, you're definitely going to want to do a postmortem on that because this is something everybody needs to learn from. Whereas if it's kind of a minor outage, maybe it's not as important, or maybe you just do something a little bit more informal. It's really going to be kind of up to you. Excellent. Um, now, this is... Uh could be a touchy question in some organizations, but how do you handle situations where one of the major causes of the outage was due to a decision made by a C-level executive? <clears throat> yeah, so obviously, you know, this whole conversation has been about not blaming individuals, but you can never get away from the idea that someone did have some sort of role in it. And as I tried to highlight, you know, you just, you never know what other factors may be involved with that person or, or whatever it may be. So when you're talking about um, executives, you do need to sort of be sensitive of, about that. And obviously you don't want to, um, you, as we talked about, you don't want to blame, but you just sort of want to be able to get right to the specifics of what happened without um, addressing who may have made those suggestions or maybe who may have come down with some sort of objective and said this is what we're going to do um, in a very sensitive way I would guess with these C-level managers you need to just skip right over all of that and go right to what is it that um, we were trying to accomplish why did we want to do this and how did we get to this point rather than um, you know talking about who made this suggestion or who made this request so it's definitely a sensitive area and it probably will take some practice but I think as long as you focus on the how, the how rather than the why and, and just sort of try to keep in mind, um, you know, not pointing fingers at any one particular person or team, uh, it actually shouldn't be that big of a deal. Excellent. Uh, we have some really good questions coming in. Here's another one. What advice do you have for a team whose manager isn't sold on the blameless postmortem? <laughs> yeah, so this question comes up a lot. Um, not everyone subscribes to this idea of blameless postmortems. They kind of feel like somebody has to be, you know, at fault in many cases. Um, what my suggestion usually is, um, is sort of a bottom-up approach and just get as many members of your team kind of on the same page, you know, build that culture around we all agree that this is the way to go. <clears throat> and you just start, you start doing it. You start hosting your blameless postmortems. And of course, invite any member that maybe is hesitant or doesn't really, like I said, subscribe to the idea of postmortems. And just let them sort of judge for themselves after a while, you know. <clears throat> um, invite them to be a part of it uh, and say, you know, this, these are the rules. You know, we're, we're going to call it puppies and rainbows, and there's, there's not, there's, you're not allowed to use counterfactuals. You're not allowed to use any blaming, and please just respect those rules. And then let's talk about it offline and let me know what your thoughts are. So I think if you just kind of start involving um, people who maybe just aren't quite totally on board with that idea, um, you know, just, again, remind them this is all about learning and then kind of get their thoughts on it afterwards. And maybe, you know, you'll get some valuable feedback that you can then apply towards 
um, any postmortems moving forward. Excellent. Um, this is this is an interesting question. If the focus of the postmortem meeting is diverted from the problem to personality, how can you handle that? From the problem to personality. Well, personality obviously is a is an area that's very very gray and going to be part of that whole human side. Um, so, if someone starts to sort of go down that path of, well, this person is just a bully, um, or this person is lazy, or anything that starts to insinuate personality, um, I think the, the responsi responsibility, responsibility kind of falls back on either the incident commander or whoever's running that postmortem, or just the team in general. It kind of goes back to the whole culture of everyone being on the same page that, um, you know, we're not here to talk about um, people and their sort of habits or their personalities. We're here to talk about the specifics on what happened and how we can learn from this. So anytime it starts to drift away from that, it's really the responsibility of everyone involved to recognize that and, and, and move away from that. Uh, because honestly, that's skipping over what actually took place and going right to counterfactuals and going right to blaming individuals or personalities for a problem when actually a personality you know, has nothing to do with the, um, you know, let's say there's a situation where someone was able to delete a cluster of servers from, for a command line. You could say that that person did it because they were lazy and they just didn't pay attention to what they were typing into their command line. Well, yeah, you can make that argument, but that's just simply not true. The fact is, um, how was that person able to do that from the command line in the first place? So you have to just be able to recognize that and um, make an effort to move away from that type of uh, conversation. Fantastic. Uh, we have one more question here. Um, this is more kind of a definition question, but can a postmortem also be a lessons learned session or is that something separate? Yeah, totally. Those are, in my mind, um, one and the same. So anything, like I mentioned earlier on in the presentation, there's all kinds of names for it. You can, you can call it whatever you want. We call it blameless postmortems. Um, but yeah, lessons learned um, is just, in my mind, just a pseudonym, just another name for the exact same process. So if you're doing something like that already, then it sounds like you're probably already participating in, in something like this, or maybe it needs to be tweaked a little bit. But um, yeah, to me, those are essentially the same thing. All right, and looks like we have time for just one more here. How do you ensure that the reme remediation plan actually gets executed on? Excellent question. So, yeah, let's say, for example, you know, uh, some sort of bug has been entered into your, your bug tracking software. You know, someone has to still kind of stay on top of that. So, <clears throat> a lot of cases, you know, there's going to be either the incident commander or whoever was on call or maybe even the person who entered in that bug um, is going to be the one who's now responsible for sort of following it up or at least making sure that it does get, um, uh, you know, not just entered in as a bug but then uh, maybe moved or assigned to a, another sprint that maybe you're going to be working on soon or assigned to a specific person. Typically, I would say that um, that's just going to be whoever is the person that uh, entered in that bug is going to be sort of the owner unless someone else chimes in and says, you know, I'm, I'm the product manager, so I'm going to ensure that this gets into, you know, the next sprint because I find this to be a high priority bug. Um, but if that, you know, if that's not the situation, typically I think it's going to be um, kind of owned by the person that puts it into um, whatever their system is or whoever maybe made that suggestion in terms of what the actionable item is. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, I know there have been a lot of questions coming in, and we do want to let you know that we have a few content pieces available for you. We have an intro to postmortem piece that you can download that takes you step by step through why you would want to do a postmortem and how to easily get started with one. And then additionally, if you want to dive deeper into the blameless postmortem, we have a content piece available also. Um, so either one of those are uh, free to download uh, because you attended the webinar. So we appreciate that. I'll let Jason talk a little bit about his next upcoming webinar. Yeah, thanks, Tara. So um, obviously I'm very passionate about the subject of blameless postmortems. I've given a number of talks on it and met with a lot of different people and had some great conversations about this. Um, but another one that I, I just am fascinated about is the idea of chat ops. So um, in I think the first week of November, <clears throat> we'll actually be doing another webinar um, on the subject of chat ops. So if that is of interest to you, I encourage you to join us uh, in November because this should be a really fun um, and sort of 
in my mind, hopefully fascinating uh, discussion on what you can do and what you can't do with chat ops. Or if you've never even heard of the idea of chat ops, um, it should be useful for you because there's a lot of great um, things that you can do uh, when it comes to the subject of chat ops. And um, I'll hopefully provide a lot of detail and a lot of great examples of what some people are doing um, from a number of um, you know, larger customers, GitHub, Etsy, um, some people that you're probably familiar with. So that should be a fun talk, and I'm really looking forward to it. So definitely uh, join me in November if that's of interest to you. And uh, I guess with that said, you know, uh, we hope you had uh, a good time and that you got some great information from this. We look forward to hearing back from you. If you've got any questions, just email me at jason at victorops.com. You can find me on Twitter at Jason Hand. Um, and if you're interested in giving VictorOps a try, be sure to check us out. Um, get a demo. We're, we do demos at 2 o'clock every Tuesday, uh, 2 o'clock Mountain Time here. And um, yeah, we'd love to hear from you. If you have any other additional questions or thoughts, um, I'm happy to, uh, happy to be involved with the conversation with you. So with that, uh, we'll say goodbye. So thank you. Thanks.